Hey, what's up everyone? This is Ryan with Escotech, and I'm going to take this Dell Optiplex 7040, add this RAM and SSD, and this GPU to give this system a major upgrade and a whole new lease on life. Stick around for the results. I love upgrading old computers, and this time I'm going to show you how to upgrade this PC with as much modern tech as possible on a decent budget. In this video I will go over the parts I selected and why, cover some BIOS settings I'd like to change, then I'll benchmark the PC and take a look at power use and thermals. Finally I will go over the final cost of this PC and compare this system to a new build with similar performance. This is a look at the front of the Dell Optiplex 7040. This system supports 6th generation Intel processors and I was able to buy this one locally for $120 with a Core i5-6500 but no RAM or SSD. This is a relatively recent quad-core processor with a base speed of 3.2 GHz and a turbo boost of 3.6 GHz. Counting the front USB ports, the system has a total of 6 USB 3.0 ports, 4 USB 2.0 ports, 2 display port, 1 HDMI, and an 8th inch audio jack. Onboard video connectors won't really matter for this video, and neither will the PS2 mouse and keyboard connectors or the serial port. Inside the PC, we'll start with the power supply, which is only rated at 240 watts but is 80 plus platinum certified. There are three PCI Express slots, one is a full 16x slot, one is 8x, and one is a 1x slot for your smaller cards you might want to add. There's also still an old PCI slot, meant for legacy PCI cards that might still have a specific purpose. Over on the right side of the board, here are the two main reasons I went with the Optiplex 7040. First, it's the first Optiplex model to support DDR4 RAM, and second, it's also the first to use M.2 SSDs, and it's compatible with the newest NVMe SSDs. More on that in a minute. The GPU I selected is the NVIDIA GTX 1650 Super. This card is rated as one of the best GPUs money can buy when it comes to a price to performance ratio. I bought this MSI model from Newegg for $160. While I struggle to get it out of the static bag, I will take time to say that the card offers great performance at 1080p, as it's slightly faster than a GTX 1066 gig version. But the main drawback is that this card only has 4 gigabytes of VRAM. That's a small amount of VRAM for the year 2020 and severely limits this card from gaming at resolutions above 1080p. That said, if you're watching this video, you're probably fine with gaming at 1080p. For RAM, I went with 16GB of G-Skill Aegis DDR4 memory. This RAM is clocked at 2400MHz, but the CPU's max memory speed is 2133, so we'll downclock to that speed. This DDR4 with a CAS latency of 15 should offer a decent bump in performance over previous Optiplex generations that only had 1600MHz DDR3. I mentioned earlier that this Dell Optiplex is compatible with NVMe solid-state drives. These drives offer performance gains over SATA SSDs as they run on the PCI Express bus. I chose a 500GB Western Digital SN550 that I purchased from Newegg for $65. Now that we've got all our components lined up, let's move on to the assembly of the computer. Like previous Optiplex generations, this case is basically toolless. To take off the side panel, you just slide this plastic button over and pull with a little force and it will come off. The front panel has three long clips that lift with a little force and then it will swing out from the slots on the other side. Then this metal side piece will release by pressing this button and swinging it open on its hinge. And now I have access to all the internal components. Something that is good practice when dealing with a used computer that has a few years of use on it is to apply a new thermal paste to the CPU. This heat sink has four Phillips screws on it. Just loosen the screws to lift the heat sink. And as you can see, the old thermal paste is dried and crusty and won't work as well as it should. Go ahead and clean that off with a paper towel or a cloth that won't tear apart or leave any lint behind. I actually know some people that like to use coffee filters for this purpose. It'll take a little scraping to get all of it off and maybe some isopropyl alcohol, but once you get a smooth surface, you should be ready to go. After you've done the same cleaning to the CPU, go ahead and apply a bead of thermal compound and reapply your heatsink. The key when installing a heatsink is to use a diagonal pattern when tightening the screws. This will spread out the thermal paste and give you a nice even coverage between your CPU and heatsink. Moving on to RAM installation, start by opening the white clips on the ends of the RAM slots. We will install the RAM in alternating slots labeled 1 and 2 to have them in the same channel. 
having dual channel RAM isn't as important as it used to be, but you might as well do it properly. Next, just line up the notch in the RAM with the notch in the slot and push down on top of the RAM with even pressure. It should snap in and close the clips. Repeat the process with the second stick of RAM, and we now have 16 gigabytes of solid RAM to use in our system. Next, we'll install the M.2 SSD. Line up the notch and insert it at about a 15 degree angle from the slot and push it into the connector. This screw can be a pain if you don't have one. It won't come with the drive and usually comes with the new motherboard. Some Dell PCs will already have a screw in the standoff. If yours doesn't, be sure to source a screw before your build. It's basically the same screw used in laptop Wi-Fi cards. Push the M.2 SSD down and tighten the screw to secure it in place. And finally, we'll install the GPU. These Dell models just have a plastic clip at the end, so you don't have any clips to slide before you put the card in. Just lift the rear I.O. bracket, remove the two middle rear I.O. covers, remove any protective covers on your GPU, line the card up with the top PCI Express slot, in this case it's the blue one, and push it down. Once the card is securely in the slot, make sure the other rear I.O. covers are in place and close the rear bracket. The last thing with the GPU installation is to connect the external power connector. The power supply on this Dell doesn't come with any PCI Express power connectors, so we are going to use this dual SATA to PCI Express adapter. This was purchased for $4 on Amazon, and we'll use the two available SATA connectors on the front for external power to our card. Most of the power is going to come from the PCI Express slot, but this will provide the last 25 to 30 watts the GTX 1650 Super is going to need. I'll connect the two male connectors to the two front SATA ports. Then I'll take the plus two power from the PCI Express port out, just plug in the six pin power adapter, and we'll tie back the plus two because we don't need eight pin power. I'm just going to zip tie the plus two and the SATA connectors together, and I'll cut that off and get these cables routed into a good spot where they won't be in our way. So that's everything, we have our GPU, our CPU and RAM and our SSD all ready to go. Everything has power and we're ready to boot the system up for the first time. Since we're using an M.2 for our SSD we won't need the SATA cable anymore so I'm just going to get it out of the way. Then I'll go ahead and pull the PCI Express power connectors over so they're out of the way. I'll make sure I don't have any cables that are going to hit any fans. And I'll go ahead and close the side of the case and give it a good push to lock it down. To put the front panel back on, you just line up the three curved clips on the back side of the case. Use those as a hinge. Then close it and push until the three connectors on the top lock into place. And finally to put the side panel back on, I'm gonna lay the PC on its side. I'll put the side panel on and work it into place. Make sure the spring-loaded clip is in the right position. Get it lined up and slide it until the clip locks into place. And now I've got everything hooked up, and moment of truth, we'll go ahead and press the power button and make sure the PC posts. It's not uncommon for this first post to take a little while, as it's reading the XMP data off the RAM, and making sure everything is in good working order, and once that takes place, we should have our Dell post screen. And there it is. On the first boot, I like to go ahead and press F2 to go into the BIOS and take a look at some settings that I'm going to change. 
We are now in the BIOS of the system, and the first thing I'm going to do is check and see that all of our components show up correctly. And I see all 16 gigabytes of RAM, so everything checks out there. Next I'll go and be sure that the system is in UEFI mode. A lot of times these are set to legacy. You can leave legacy option ROM enabled. The next thing I'm going to do is change the network options. The NIC is usually set to enabled with Pixie. I'm going to move it to enabled. Then I'm going to go ahead and make sure that it is in AHCI mode. If you have RAID on and don't actually set up an array, it should revert to AHCI mode. And I guess since we're not using a, any SATA drives, it won't really matter, but if you might add it, you still want it to be in AHCI. There's nothing else in any of these sections that I like to change. You can turn on smart reporting if you'd like. Uh, Multi-display will let you use your GPU and your Envoy graphics at the same time. Uh, I'm going to set the graphics card, make sure that's set to NVIDIA as the primary display adapter. Secure boot, we're going to leave disabled so we can install our OS. Performance, make sure all your cores are on, occasionally you'll see that. Speed step and C states, I'm going to leave enabled if you'd like to turn those off to make sure you're running at full speed all the time you can, but there's no real reason to. Turbo boost will also leave on just to make sure it turbos to its maximum frequency. change any options in here. Uh, post behavior, I'm going to go in and change fast boot. Uh, I like to leave it on auto instead of thorough. Auto will basically let it boot up a little faster if you don't make any changes and thorough is going to check for changes every time. So that'll slow down your post time a little bit. So auto will allow it to skip some of the post options that it doesn't really need to do every time. So now I will hit apply and there's no reason to really save it unless you're going to plan on changing your BIOS settings from time to time. And I'm going to go ahead and put a USB 3.0 drive into our blue 3.0 USB port on the front. And I'm going to go ahead and hit exit and reboot and just let it boot from the USB drive to install Windows. And I won't have any other UAFI boot options available, so it should just use the flash drive automatically. So there's no reason for me to go into the boot menu by pressing F12 here. I'm going to speed this up, and I'll try not to bore everybody too much with the Windows installation. That is outside of the scope of this video, but I'm sure you can find another YouTube video that will show you how to do it. But real quick, I will accept the Microsoft license terms. I will click Custom to Advance, and I'll click New to partition my SSD for Windows installation. Once I have my four partitions, I will go ahead and click Next to install. Windows installation only takes about five minutes if you've got a fast drive and a fast USB drive. So we'll get through this pretty quickly and I'm gonna go ahead and move on to some benchmarks. I did go ahead and install all of our drivers and updates and now I'm running Prime 95 to test the stability of the system and see what our thermals first look like. Prime 95 has been running for about a half an hour and our system is pulling a total of 96 watts, so our power usage is looking pretty good. The CPU did hit a max of 81 degrees Celsius, which is a little high, but I'm in my garage right now. And the temperature in here is about upper 80s Fahrenheit, so we've got a high ambient temperature so the temps don't concern me too much. Next I'm going to move on to a 3D benchmark. I'm going to start with all benchmark Catzilla, mostly because I like monster movies. This is kind of a fun benchmark to run and it does a pretty good job testing your system. I will break it out again here in a second and we'll go ahead and look at the power usage. So if you like watching cats fight, you can watch the video for a little longer. Otherwise I'll break it out and we'll go look at the power usage again. As I trace the cable over to my kilowatt, you can see that right now it's pulling 150 watts. So we're still well under the threshold of the 240 watt power supply we've got. And Catzilla score came back at 24,586 on the 720p preset. Next we'll move on to Unigen's Valley benchmark. This is their DirectX 11 benchmark that still does a good job benchmarking a system these days. I'll break it out again and take a look at power usage as I trace my cable over to my kilowatt. And now we're using 158 watts or so. Right around 160 now, so we're still looking pretty good. And finally for the synthetic benchmarks, we're going to look at Unigen's Superposition benchmark. This is our DirectX 12 benchmark, and looking at the power usage, you can see that we have 
about 150 watts used now. So again, we're still looking pretty good power-wise. And superposition's result was 6,497 on the 1080p high setting. So I wanted to run one modern game benchmark, and I chose the in-game benchmark for Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The first scene in the benchmark basically starts with Laura Croft modeling in a city for us. This scene stays right around 70 FPS. The second scene walking through the jungle also stays in about the mid 60s. And the final scene starts right around 100 FPS, but as more detail comes into the screen, it goes down to about the 60 to 70 FPS range. And backing out and taking a look at the power usage, I can break out from the benchmark and look at my kilowatt again. And as I trace the cord over, we can see that this one is using around 179, 180 watts or so. So this is our most power hungry benchmark that we've ran so far. But all of the benchmarks, including Shadow of the Tomb Raider, stayed well underneath the 240 watt output of our power supply. And the results of the Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark gave us an average FPS of 68. Now we'll take a look at the total cost of the PC. We start with our Dell Optiplex 7040 that was $120 with a CPU only. 16 gigabytes of RAM was $60. Our 500 gig Western Digital SSD was 65. And our GTX 1650 Super was 160 for a total of $405. And while $405 is definitely approaching the upper limit of what I would suggest spending on a build like this, it's not bad for a PC that can play basically any game really well at 1080p. The GTX 1650 also has a new hardware encoder from NVIDIA, so this PC will also do really well encoding videos. In fact, there isn't much this PC wouldn't do well. Finally, for a comparison, I headed over to PCPartPicker.com. And as you can see, with a Core i3-9100F, which is what I think would be the closest current processor performance-wise, uh, an Azurac motherboard, 16 gigs of RAM, the same SSD, same GPU, uh, basic case, pretty basic power supply, and a, an official copy of Windows 10 Home, we're right about $690. Can also probably add another 30 if you needed an optical drive, so probably plan on right around $700 for a comparable build. And that's it for this video. If you liked the video, please click like or consider subscribing to my channel. I do tech videos very similar to this most of the time with a couple other videos sprinkled in here and there. Thanks for watching.